Go to sleep, not a peep. Go to sleep, little victim. Close your eyes, say goodbye. It's coming in your dreams. You can't run, you can't hide. He's already inside. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the only thing to watch considering everything else has been cancelled. Today, with gas prices at an all-time low, I'm here to make sure that that nightmare fuel gauge is also flowing strong before you lay your head down onto your pillow tonight. Today, we're talking about Try to Fall Asleep. It's a game that you should pester your favorite YouTuber to play because while it made the rounds about two years ago, a new version of it just came out this year, and it is so, so much better than it was two years ago. It has more knights, it has a whole lot more monsters, and it's simply terrifying. It's also incredibly well done for a project that, like, no one has really heard about. And I mean that! Right now, I think our playthrough on GT Live is the only channel so far to have played through this new version of the thing, which I gotta say is a shame because it is really, really really worth your time. So get on it, Jacksepticeye, and Markiplier, and Super Horror Bro, and 8-Bit Ryan, and Fusion Z Gamer, and all you other indie horror bros out there. This game needs attention. And quite honestly, we all just need content that isn't FNAF related too. That'd also be nice. The premise of Try to Fall Asleep seems pretty simple at first. You play the role of John Heron, who survived a terrible accident that's left both his brain and his memories damaged. You have memory losses as well as a few brain damages that might cause you to, um, hallucinate. Dr. Richard Norberg and your friendly robot assistant AB have prescribed a treatment for these problems, a good old night's rest. Luckily for you, all those damages can be easily cured. In order to heal your brain damage, you'll just have to sleep and rest. Sleeping is the best medicine for your brain. From there, the game is divided into two parts, falling asleep and then dreaming. I mean, seriously, how hard can that be, right? Oh, jeez! Oh, my God! Oh, God! You see, the first phase is falling asleep, closing your eyes long enough to help John actually pass into unconsciousness. And that's what separates this from your usual FNAF-style gameplay. FNAF is all about managing meters and being alert of all your surroundings at all times. Here, you're actually forced to close your eyes. You are forced to be unaware of your surroundings. And who knows what horrific creature is going to be standing over you when you open them back up again. <laughs> And the thing is, not even your shut eyes are safe, because faded monsters and lost bits of memory, but mostly monsters, attack you even in the darkness there. It's this incredible detail that the designers included. It's so smart. And if you do manage to get past phase one and fall asleep, well, then you're thrust into the second style of gameplay, the dreams, when you begin uncovering your lost memories by replaying the traumatic events of John's past through some intense minigames. You lose here, and you flatline out in real life. Your dreams have literally killed you. Now, I don't know about you, but a game about trying to fall asleep while laying in bed being confronted by all your fears and anxieties, I feel seen. But just how fatal can sleep deprivation and your own dreams actually be? And what, if anything, can that information tell us about the events that we're seeing in the game? Well, the answer to that, my friends, begins with a story. April 1987, Chicago. A man cries out in his sleep and dies. He's middle-aged, he has no medical problems, his autopsy gives no clues as to what happened, and yet he's the 130th victim of what they call Bangangut, the nightmare death. When it strikes, it's always men, average age 33, and it always happens at night when they're asleep. Most are Hmong refugees, men from Laos who fought for America during the Vietnam War, men who became targets when the US left the area and the Laotian government fell under communist rule. These were men who were chased out of their homes, forced to escape from a living nightmare, only to wind up in the US still being chased, but this time by a different kind of nightmare, one that would prove to be all too real. In 1981 alone, 26 men will succumb to the nightmare death. One story about a younger victim of the nightmare death goes like this. You must sleep 
his family says. He replies, no, you don't understand. I've had nightmares before. This is different. He told his parents he was afraid that if he slept, the thing chasing him would get him. So he tried to stay awake for days at a time. In desperation, the family even tried giving him sleeping pills. Finally, while watching television with the family, he fell asleep on the couch. Thankful that the crisis was finally over, they literally carried him upstairs to bed. Then they heard the screams. Screams in the middle of the night. By the time they got to his room, he was dead. He had died in the middle of a nightmare. They found in his closet a Mr. Coffee Maker, full of hot coffee that he'd been using to try and keep awake, as well as all the sleeping pills that he'd been spitting back up. The autopsy revealed that there was no heart attack. He had just died for unexplained reasons. Another story, this time from a survivor. First, I was surprised, but right away I got real scared. I was lying in bed, a dark shadow in the night. I kept waking up because I was thinking so much about my problems. I heard a noise, but when I turned, tried, I couldn't move. My bedroom looked the same, but I could see in the corner a dark shape was coming to me. It came to the bed over my feet my legs. It was very heavy, like a heavy weight over my whole body, my legs, my chest. My chest was frozen, like I was drowning. I had no air. I tried to yell so someone sleeping very close to me will hear. I tried to move using a force that I can, a strength that I can have. I thought, what if I die? After a long time, it went away. It just left. I got up and turned all the lights on. I was afraid to sleep again. Now, the nightmare death and that final story is a very real thing, a tragic story about a still unsolved series of deaths among this very specific group of Hmong refugees where, in the span of 10 years, 130 men died. The final explanation that medical professionals settled on was a combination of stress, being a refugee from your home country and having to assimilate into a new culture, coupled with possible genetic heart defects. It wasn't a perfect explanation, it didn't explain away all the various cases, but it was about as close as they could get. Meanwhile, the story about the Buenos coffee maker, that one I can't officially validate. It's actually a story recounted by horror master Wes Craven based off of when he first read about the nightmare deaths in the LA Times. He said in interviews that it was a real article published on the subject, but as far as I could tell, I looked through every article in the LA Times about the Hmong refugees and the mysterious nighttime deaths, and I couldn't find any specific reference to a young boy and his coffee maker, so it might be more of a fabrication that his head made up after reading the story. That said, it was powerful enough for him to create what is perhaps one of horror's most iconic monsters, Freddy Krueger. The dream killer. But the takeaway of all of these stories is the idea of your dreams killing you. It seems like it should be the kind of thing that you would only encounter in a horror movie or a horror game, but it's frighteningly real. It's affecting real people for reasons that we still don't understand to this day. The concept that we see play out in Try to Fall Asleep, where John Heron experiences some kind of terrible accident and then dies in his dreams in the aftermath as he tries to recover, that actually parallels the real-life cases of nightmare death surprisingly well. Horrific tragedy, extreme stress, killer dreams. But now that we've talked about the dreams, let's go back to the first half of each game's night and explore the game's basic premise, trying to fall asleep. We're told that John Heron's hallucinations, creepy monsters that make it hard for him to relax long enough to close his eyes and fall asleep, are caused by the damage that was done to his brain in the incident that left him hospitalized, and that if he's unable to go to sleep, he will die from insomnia. And in this case too, fact winds up being scarier than the game's fiction. One of the most famous case studies for sleep deprivation involves a 17-year-old boy by the name of Randy Gardner, who, in 1964, set a world record by going without sleep for 11 days and 25 minutes. His record has since been beaten, but Randy Gardner remains one of the most famous cases because of how well documented his experiment was. Throughout the process, a sleep researcher from Stanford and a lieutenant commander from the U.S. Navy Neurological Center monitored his health. Things started slow. On day two, Randy had difficulty recognizing objects by touch. By day three, he was having extreme mood swings. It wasn't until day four that he started having full-on hallucinations, but once they started, things got wacky. It started with him seeing a street sign and thinking that it was a person. Later that day, he suddenly believed himself to be a famous football player. By day five, the hallucinations were becoming much more vivid, including him seeing a path through a quiet forest, despite the fact that he was indoors the entire time. By day 10, he was experiencing paranoia that a radio Radio host was trying to embarrass him live on the air. And Randy isn't alone with these sorts of symptoms. His symptoms are similar to those of a New York disc jockey, Peter Tripp, who endured a 200-hour sleepless marathon to raise money for charity. By day four, he thought that spots on the table around him were spiders crawling around his radio 
booth, even complaining that they were spinning webs on his shoes. At the end of his eight sleepless days, a neurologist came to examine Peter and give him the all clear, but when he saw the doctor dressed in a dark suit, he believed him to be an undertaker coming to bury him alive. The whole thing ended with him screaming in fear and running for the door half naked. Looking online for other stories of the effects of sleep deprivation, you see common traits like pulsating walls, shadow people, animals or insects moving along your peripheral vision, cars floating, and a whole lot of paranoia. In short, the effects of sleep deprivation, especially day four and onward, are very similar to the symptoms of psychosis. This is something that's actually confirmed by researchers at the Clinical Research Center of Greylands Hospital in Perth, Australia, who conducted a meta-study. A meta-study is basically a study that looks at a bunch of other existing research and tries to identify wider patterns across those studies, and found that, quote, going without sleep for long periods of time can produce a range of experiences, including perceptual distortions and hallucinations, end quote. And those hallucinations aren't just visual either. A lot of times they're auditory, and even in some rare cases olfactory, smell hallucinations. In short, all symptoms of acute psychosis. So again, in our game Try to Fall Asleep, it seems very fitting that John Heron, whose problems relate to a seeming inability to fall asleep, would start experiencing exactly these sorts of visual and auditory hallucinations that are associated with real-world sleep loss. But that's not where the game stops. Obviously, Try to Fall Asleep pushes past the realm of table spiders and street sign people. It goes straight to the biggest question of them all. Could long-term sleep deprivation kill you? Now, obviously, there haven't been any clinical trials forcing people to stay awake for weeks and weeks to see if they literally die from sleep deprivation for very obvious reasons. But ethical standards are a bit more lax when it comes to lab rats. In one study conducted at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Chicago in 1989, 10 rats were subjected to total sleep deprivation. Starting at day 11 and continuing on until day 32, all of those rats died. The researchers found no anatomical causes of their death. The rats weren't dehydrated, the rats weren't starving, they just died with no apparent cause. Let me say that again, they do not know what killed these rats. They just don't know. They have a couple of theories. Rat death theories. It could have been body temperatures dropping, it could have been bacteria that's usually in the intestines starting to seep out into the rest of the body as sleeplessness allowed the body to relax and release the hounds. Could have been brain damage or again, just like we saw with the nightmare deaths, stress. And in humans, there is this super rare condition known as fatal insomnia. It's a genetic condition where over the course of 18 months, a person just starts experiencing progressively worse levels of sleeplessness, eventually leading to hallucinations, panic attacks, paranoia, rapid weight loss, and finally death. Don't worry though, there have only been 24 cases in the world. So, not that we needed to torture a bunch of poor lab rats to know it, but scientific research has confirmed that sleep is indeed very important, even though science itself doesn't really know what it does. But you could literally die without it. But try to fall asleep is about more than just trying to avoid death from sleep deprivation or death by nightmare. In the game, John Heron is trying to fall asleep specifically because it's supposed to help him recover from his brain injuries and regain his lost memories. Memory losses as well as a few brain damages that might force you to um, hallucinate. Well, luckily for you, all those damages can be easily cured. In order to heal your brain damage, you'll just have to sleep and rest. Sleeping is the best medicine for your brain. So is sleep really the best medicine for John's brain? Is recovering his memories and his brain function actually something that sleep can do? Well, there does seem to be a relationship between recovery from traumatic brain injury, like the kind that John experienced, and improvement of sleep. According to a study published in the academic journal Neurology, researchers found that there were indeed associations between consciousness, cognitive functioning, and measures of healthy sleep. So does that mean that Dr. Rick Norberg is right when he says that sleep heals all wounds? Well, it might first seem that way. After all, recovering from traumatic brain injury seems to be associated with improved sleep. However, just looking at the association doesn't tell us the full story. As they say, correlation does not always mean causation, and sometimes it's easy to get cause and effect backwards. In fact, looking at this study more closely, results showed that when the brain has not sufficiently recovered at a certain level of consciousness, it's also unable to generate a 24-hour sleep-wake cycle in consolidated nighttime sleep. Blah, 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 blah. Why does science always overcomplicate how things are said? That's a hypothetical question. I know the answer. The answer is actually to make sure that the words are precise enough so that way people aren't extrapolating wrong conclusions from their research. I get it. Fine. Let me translate this to layman's terms, okay? People who had traumatic brain injury were often unable to experience healthy sleep due to their brain trauma interfering with their normal sleep cycle. In other words, this isn't a case of people sleeping more and their brains recovering from traumatic injury. It's actually a case of people recovering from traumatic brain injury and their improved brain function causing them to sleep better. In short, if Dr. Norberg's goal 
is to get John Heron back to full health as quickly and safely as possible in the game, Dr. Rick ain't doing too good of a job. Not only does he flub some of the basic science on the interactions between traumatic brain injury and sleep, but his belief that sleep is all that John needs to recover his memories is depriving John of real treatments that would actually help him in his recovery. It's almost as if this doctor doesn't really want what's best for his patient. Maybe Dr. Norberg here has some other motives up his sleeve for keeping John terrified, rather than on the correct road to recovery. It wouldn't surprise me to see this become the big twist of the game as things continue to develop over the next couple nights. Until then, though, we'll just have to wait and see, since Try to Fall Asleep is still in its early access phase, with many nights and hopefully many more answers still yet to come. As we unravel more of the mystery of John Heron's past, and perhaps more importantly, his present, I think we're gonna learn that there's more to this Dr. Norberg and his robotic assistant than meets the eye. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Sweet dream. And just one final reminder here, Game Theory hoodies are still in stock, but not for too much longer. We only have a few days left in the sale, so if you're interested in nabbing an awesome Japanese-inspired Game Theory hoodie, check out the merch shelf down below. If you like them baggy, order one size above what you would normally get, because we ordered these to be a little bit tighter. And yes, we have gotten it confirmed by hundreds of Japanese speakers in the comments of the last episode that this hoodie does not say anything about udon noodles. So thank you all for independently confirming that. Glad we got it right. Now you can walk around proud out of what you're wearing.